Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my midweek mystery series where today I want to share the story of the Fort Worth Trio. Sometimes I just watch news clips or true crime reports on YouTube just letting it autoplay so I can make sure that I'm keeping up to date with what's going on in the world of true crime. It's how I find a lot of case updates. A couple of weeks ago, a video from the Fort Worth Star Telegram played about a girl called Rachel Trelisa, an interview with her mother and brother in which they talk about the impact that her disappearance had on them and on the community as a whole. They said how they like to keep her story alive, they like to talk about it, to ensure that people don't forget to keep searching. How they don't want to let the story die until they get answers. And I took that as a sign that I need to cover it here on my channel. So this is a story of the missing Fort Worth trio. Rachel Trelisa, Renee Wilson and Julie Ann Mosley, who all went missing whilst Christmas shopping in Fort Worth, Texas on 23rd of December 1974. Lisa Renee Wilson, known by her middle name of Renee to everyone, was born on the 29th of August 1960. In 1974, she was 14 years old, a white female with brown hair and reddish highlights and brown eyes. She was 5 foot 2 tall and 110 pounds. Renee's mother worked at a local dry cleaners, so a lot of the time when her mum was at work, Renee would go and stay at her grandmother's house, and she'd stayed there the night before she disappeared. She spent a lot of time there. Across the street from Renee's grandmother lived the Mosleys, and Renee had been dating 15-year-old Terry Mosley for a while. The two of them had grown up together, seeing as Renee spent so much time at her grandmother's house throughout her childhood, and eventually their friendship progressed to more, they started dating. The morning of the disappearance, the 23rd of December 1974, Terry had actually popped round to visit Renee and had given her a promise ring, promising that one day they would get married, and he says that she was so happy. The younger sister of Terry was nine-year-old Julianne Mosley. Julie was nine years old, she was born on the 5th of April 1965, and at the time of her disappearance was four foot three and 85 pounds. She was a white female with light brown hair and blue eyes. She had a scar under her left eye, a scar in the middle of her forehead, and a round scar on the back of her calf. Julie and Renee were close, as just like with Terry, she had also grown up with Julie. Another one of Renee's friends was 17-year-old Mary Rachel Trelisa, who was also known by her middle name of Rachel. Rachel was 5 foot 6, 108 pounds, a white female with brown hair and blue green eyes. She had a chipped upper front tooth and a small scar on her chin. She may have also responded to the name Rachel Arnold, her maiden name, as Rachel would actually be married to her husband Tommy Trelisa for around 6 months. Tommy was in his early 20s and already had a 2 year old son from a previous marriage, but everyone says that him and Rachel were very, very happy together. Rachel would have been wearing her wedding ring at the time of the disappearance. So that morning, 23rd December, Rachel asked Renee if she wanted to go to the mall with her. It was two days before Christmas and she wanted to get some Christmas shopping done. Renee agreed and asked Terry to come with them, but he decided to go visit a friend who was going into hospital to have an operation instead. Rachel had also asked Tommy, her husband, to join her, but he too had other plans. But little nine-year-old Julie did beg to go with them, wanting to hang out with the older girls. Terry told Bianca Hillier for NBC News in December 2018 that he knew that Renee and Rachel didn't want Julie tagging along with them that day because she was nine years old. But Julie got on the phone to her mum who was at work and she begged and begged to go. And despite usually saying no, her mum allowed it this time, trusting Renee to look after her because she knew Renee so well. And Renee and Rachel weren't about to say no, you can't come with us, so they just let her come. Sometime before noon, Rachel drove Renee and Julie to the mall in her car, a 1972 Oldsmobile 98. On the way, they stopped at the Army Navy store as Renee had to pick up some jeans that she'd ordered and then they continued on their journey to the Seminary South Shopping Centre in South Fort Worth. The centre is now known as La Grand Plaza. We know they arrived at the mall as Rachel parked her car on the top floor of the car park next to Sears, which is where it would later be found by family members when they went searching. 
Julie's mum had told her that she wanted a home by six at the very latest, but Rachel and Renee actually aimed to be home earlier than that by 4pm as they were going to a Christmas party, but they never showed, and eventually people started to worry. At around 6pm, some family members and some other people from the neighbourhood decided to drive the 10 minutes to the mall to see if they could find the girls, and they did find Rachel's car parked on the upper level of the car park, with no signs of any struggle nearby. There was a single Christmas present on the back seat, suggesting that at some point the girls had made a trip back to the car to put the present down, and then continue with their shopping, or do something else. So we know they definitely got to the mall and they definitely did some shopping. And several people would also later remember seeing the girls at the mall, as Renee was wearing a t-shirt that made her stand out. It was a pale yellow slash green colour and had the words Sweet Honesty printed on the front in bold green lettering, as well as wearing blue or purple hip hugger trousers, red and white trainers, and the promise ring that Terry had given her that morning with a single stone. So Renee stood out. Whilst family members headed into the mall to see if they could find the girls, Terry was tasked with the job of staying at home and waiting by the phone, hoping that one of the girls would call. They never did. Rachel's mum and her 11-year-old younger brother, Rusty, went into every single shop in the mall as it was closing that night, searching for the girls, but there was no luck. The Fort Worth Police Department were notified of the girls' disappearance that very same evening, but very quickly they decided that they were runaways. We all know how important the early hours are in any abduction case, but sadly they just weren't utilised in this one. The families were sure from early on that these girls would not run away, so something must have happened to them. They hadn't taken anything with them, so no money, no clothes, and they had no reason to want to run away. I mean, even if the older girls wanted to, why would they take nine-year-old Julie with them? It just didn't make sense. And it does seem like some early and some later witnesses backed this up. A store clerk at the mall came forward saying that a woman had come up to her saying that she'd seen three girls being forced into a yellow pickup truck, but despite appeals, this woman never came forward to share more details. Another witness said they saw the girls in the security patrol car that day. An acquaintance of Rachel said that he'd seen the girls in the record department of a store just before they disappeared, saying that the two of them had even spoken briefly. He said that another person appeared to be with them. Years after the disappearance, in 1981, a man came forward saying that he'd seen another man forcing a girl into a van in the car park that day, but when he approached the scene, he was told there was a family dispute. But of course, by the time the police had taken this seriously and all the witnesses came forward, too much time had passed. The day after the girls disappeared, so we're now on Christmas Eve, 24th of December, a letter arrived at Tommy and Rachel's home addressed to Thomas A. Trelisa. The letter appeared to have been written by Rachel, but straight away things were a little bit strange. Rachel, first of all, always called her husband Tommy, never Thomas. The letter read, I know I'm going to catch it, but we had to get away. We're going to Houston. See you in about a week. The car is in Sears up a lot. Love, Rachel. Rachel had been written in the upper left corner of the envelope and the note was handwritten. So let's analyse this a little bit. I assume I know I'm going to catch it refers to her maybe catching trouble for her disappearance. And the letter gives no reason as to why she had to get away apparently. And she gives a very specific time scale here. One week. She will be back in one week. Now, if you're somebody abducting three girls and want some time to put as much space between yourself and the crime, a timescale of a week would be a pretty good amount of time to do that. Because of course, none of Rachel's loved ones believed for a second that that letter actually came from her. Tommy didn't think it was Rachel's handwriting, and there's something very weird about the way her name is signed at the end of the letter. It kind of seems like it was spelt wrong at first. The loop for the L at the end of her name was way too short at first, looking like an E instead, causing the letter writer to go back in and correct it to a taller loop. I hope I've explained that properly for my podcast listeners or anyone who wasn't able to see the picture I've currently got on the screen. But you don't often spell your name wrong. 
We all make mistakes when we're in the flow of writing, but how often do you make that mistake with your own name? I'm not saying it's impossible, but it doesn't happen all that often. Or it could be that this was Rachel's writing and she was writing it under pressure, being forced to write it by her abductor. A detective told the Fort Worth Star-Telegram the morning after the letter arrived that they did believe that Rachel had been the one to write the letter, but they didn't know if she'd been forced to write it. Over the next few years, the letter was sent to the FBI three times for analysis, and each time they would request more samples of her writing. They would send stacks of things that Rachel had written, but each time the results would come back as inconclusive. It's also noted that the handwriting was considered a childish scrawl, judged by the standards of the times. As Terry has since said to Dateline, I don't understand the letter at all. The letter seems to me like it almost points to someone who knew them. People say it's to throw us off the track. Throw us off what track? There has never been any track. I don't know if we will ever know what happened. And the letter certainly didn't help the family's cause that the girls hadn't run away. The police were already thinking they were runaways and the letter just sealed the deal it seems. For the first year of the disappearance, they were listed as runaways by the Fort Worth Police Department before they were eventually reassigned to the major case unit. But by that point, it was way too late. Again, as Terry said, I don't think the girls ran away. Renee wanted me to go with her to the mall. I am pretty sure I would have known if we were going to run away. And Rachel had this nice car to drive. If you're going to run away, why would you ditch it in the parking lot? For the first few days, I'm sure the family did hold on to hope that they had just run away. But the week's deadline from the letter came and went and Rachel and the girls never arrived home. Another question is how fast this letter seemed to arrive, with Richard Wilson, Renee's father, saying that back then the post office wasn't anywhere near as fast as it is today. I obviously can't speak to that, having not been around back in the 70s and also not living in Texas, so I'll take his word for it. But it clearly did arrive quickly, unless Rachel sent the letter before the disappearance, but the likelihood is that it really was posted after they disappeared, likely mid to late afternoon on the 23rd to arrive on the 24th. The postage stamp on the envelope had been cancelled that morning on the 24th, which is basically something that happens when a letter has gone through the postal system and they're marking it as cancelled to indicate that it had already been used to stop people just peeling off and using it again. So there clearly hadn't been much delay in the delivery of this letter. And the postmark on the envelope raised more questions than it answered as it also seemed to contain an error. The postmark read 7608 for sure, but the fifth and final number was illegible. It strangely looked to be an inverted three, but many suspect that it could have been a faded eight instead. If the postmark did read 76088, that means it came from Weatherford, which is about half an hour, 30 miles west of Fort Worth. 76083 used to be the zip code for Throckmorton, which is also west of Fort Worth, but rather just over two hours away, 126 miles. But regardless of which town the letter was posted in, interestingly, neither are en route to Houston, which is 262 miles southeast of Fort Worth. If the girls were indeed running away to Houston, as the letter suggested, there would be zero reason for them to be heading west unless the girls were running away but to somewhere other than Houston, but then again, what would be the reason to lie about where you're going? If you're really running away and don't want to be found, why just not name anywhere? I don't know if you can tell, but I don't think these girls ran away for even a second. Also, with both Weatherford and Throckmorton being relatively close, this means a super speedy next day delivery would have been more likely than if it was coming from out of state or further away. I do think there was every chance this letter was indeed posted on the late afternoon of the 23rd and the postal system just came through for them. When Tommy pulled the letter from their mailbox that morning, he was in the company of Rachel's sister Deborah, who confirmed that the letter was sealed when it arrived, it hadn't been previously opened. 19 year old Deborah had actually been living with the couple after she'd had an argument with her own boyfriend and it seems like there was a very interesting dynamic between the three of them. Before Rachel and Tommy had got married, he had previously been engaged to Deborah. 
I'm not going to pretend to know how that all went down between them, but supposedly the engagement between Tommy and Deborah had ended amicably, and they were on good terms. I mean, you would assume so, seeing as she was now living with Tommy and Rachel. Deborah had also been invited by her sister to join them at the mall that afternoon, but she declined as she'd been out until 4am. Once they had the letter, Tommy and Deborah rushed round to the Arnold household with the letter in hand, where the police were already talking with the family. But despite this interesting letter and all the potential sightings and Rachel's abandoned car, nothing ever came of the search for the girls. There was one potential lead about a week after the disappearance when a man found some undergarments near US Highway 157 that had apparently not been there on Christmas Day. It was thought that the underwear could have belonged to the girls, but after it was examined by the parents, it was determined that none of it belonged to any of them. Just another dead end. This is a case with no leads, no clues, nothing. They just disappeared and there's been nothing solid ever since. As we've covered extensively, even the letter raises more questions than it answers. In the spring of 1975, the families were forced to hire a private investigator called John Swaim to help them in their search, and from what I can gather, he was a bit of a godsend. He fought hard for the case, he called press conferences, he forced the police to hand over their case files, and asked for anonymous tips to be sent straight to him. It was actually through John's persuasion that the girl's case was eventually moved to the major case unit. He made the police take it seriously. At one point, John received a tip that the girls had been dumped in a bayou near Port Lavaca, which is 334 miles south of Fort Worth. 100 volunteers searched the area, but nothing was ever found. John also hit the headlines when a strange man called the tip line and attempted to collect the reward money in exchange for the girl's location. Again, this didn't lead anywhere, it was just somebody wanting money. In August 1975, John discovered that a 28-year-old man who had worked for a local store where Rachel had actually applied for a job not long before disappearing had been responsible for making a string of obscene phone calls. This man was using his position in store and the fact that he was receiving CVs from young women looking for jobs and was literally just taking their phone numbers off their CVs or even stealing their numbers if they were just listed as a reference and calling them. Six female job applicants received these obscene calls, and it was also found that the man had lived in the same neighbourhood as the Arnolds, Rachel's parents, but had moved away shortly before she got married. Although this was a very promising lead, nothing ever came of it. John suddenly died of a drug overdose in 1976, a death that was ruled a suicide. He had requested that upon his death, all his files be destroyed, so that's exactly what happened, including all the files containing information about the girl's disappearance. We don't know what he found, if anything. We don't know if there was something in all those files that could have been of help. It was lost forever. There were other leads that were investigated by the police department in the years that John was working on the case. In 1976, a seer called the Fort Worth Police Department and said that the bones could be found near an oil well. A big search was launched around a small town near Abilene called Rising Star, but nothing was ever found. I don't know if there was a specific reason they chose to search Rising Star instead of any other oil town. I mean, it is Texas, there's a lot of them, but I assume there was a reason for this. As you can guess, nothing was found. There have also been several occasions on which remains have been found, sometimes a group of remains, sometimes just one set, and the families collectively hold their breath, but it's never the girls. The case did eventually go cold, but in January 2001 it was reopened once again, and this time assigned to a homicide detective called Tom Betcher. Tom has said that he believes the girls left them all with someone they know, and has also said that although witnesses may have seen the girls with only one man, he suspects there might have been another adult involved as well. In April 2001, a press conference was held where investigators shared that they'd interviewed at least 20 new witnesses who had seen the girls at the mall that afternoon. They also shared that they'd narrowed down the possible suspect list to just five people, but as far as I can find, they've never shared these names publicly. 
That same month, a former Fort Worth policeman and a security guard at the Sears store approached a local news station with new information. He claimed to have seen three young girls and a young male security guard inside a pickup truck at around 11.30pm on the night of their disappearances. The girls appeared relaxed, laughing and chatty as the security guard drove them away. He said that Julie was sat next to the driver, Renee was in the middle and Rachel was next to the passenger side door. He said that he'd contacted police with this information just a few days after the disappearance but he never heard back. They failed to follow up on this until 2001. Investigators did say that they were then able to locate the security guard in question but he denied ever being with the girls. But like, you would, wouldn't you? About 20 years after John Swain died, another PI joined the case. Dan James in 1999. Rusty Arnold, Rachel's younger brother, who was just 11 years old at the time for disappearance, has made it his life's mission to find out what happened to his sister. It was actually his path he first crossed with Dan's. Dan, it seems, has been unofficially following the case since 1975, but in 1999 he officially joined the crusade, offering $25,000 of his own money as a reward in exchange for the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible for the disappearance. Apparently, as soon as he joined the case, Dan began to receive anonymous death threats telling him to stay away. Also very unprofessional of me, but the cat's actually sat just there snoring away and she looks so comfortable, I don't want to wake her. So if you can hear some little like kitty snoring, that's why. It's very cute. <laughs> Over the years, there have been multiple reports of people allegedly spotting both Rachel and Renee alive at multiple different places. Walmarts, gas stations, etc. But there's never been anything solid. Dan James says that he's received information from several credible witnesses who claim to have seen Rachel in Fort Worth during Christmas time 1998 and he has a theory that she visits or at least visited her home every year during the Christmas season. But honestly that theory sounds flimsy at best. There's never been any solid proof of this and he's evasive as to whom he thinks is behind the disappearance or why they disappeared. He did say in 2000 that he believes Rachel is, or was, the only girl of the three still alive. Sadly, it seems like there has been animosity over the years, mostly between Rachel's siblings, Deborah and Rusty. Particularly when Rusty realised that Deborah could well be involved in the disappearance. I don't know, it makes me sad that siblings could turn on one another like that, but this is their story, not mine. I don't know their relationship or what went on, so I'm not one to judge. There doesn't seem to be a specific thing that Deborah did to make her a suspect in her brother's eyes, but it's just that she was there, living with Rachel and Tommy, and she was with Tommy when he received the letter, as well as being previously engaged to him. Tommy's romantic life was a bit all over the place. He married his first wife in 1971 and had a son with her before filing for divorce in April 1974. 43 days after this, he married Rachel, but it seems that at some point in those 43 days, he had been engaged to Deborah. Six months into the marriage, Rachel disappears, and two years later, Tommy requested a divorce from Rachel on the grounds of abandonment. I don't think anyone can blame him for that, she wasn't officially declared as dead, so he wasn't a widow, but it was clear that something had happened and she wasn't coming home, a divorce makes sense. In December 1976, he married again and then divorced 18 months later and then got married again before eventually getting divorced again and marrying his current wife as of 2020. It's a spotty dating history, but does that make you a suspect in a case like this? Of course not. An article in Fort Worth Weekly does state that two of Tommy's marriage applications were conducted in Weatherford, Texas, where the letter might have been postmarked from, and both applications requested that the marriage licenses be sent to an address in Throckmorton, the other place the letter might have been postmarked from. Tommy bought a house in Throckmorton 17 months after Rachel disappeared. But this could well be a coincidence, it was just a place nearby Fort Worth but it is a question that has been raised by Rusty many times. When Fort Worth Weekly contacted Tommy, he replied saying, if you are writing things Rusty has said, then you could be opening up to legal repercussions. Rusty Arnold has done nothing but lie and put money in his pocket from this. To answer your question, I had nothing to do with the disappearance of my wife. 
I have done everything that law enforcement has asked me to do. It seems that there has never been any evidence that Tommy had anything to do with Rachel's or the rest of the girls' disappearances. He has always cooperated with law enforcement and has helped in any way he could with the investigation. Investigators have never named him a suspect or even a person of interest in the case, so I do think the above is all just pure coincidence. I debated even sharing the information, but I know that there will be people in the comments of this video questioning Tommy's innocence, and that's the information I have for you. It's just speculation with no backing as far as I can see, apart from the fact that investigators have said that they suspect that whoever abducted the girls knew them. Interestingly though, the Charlie Project pages for each of the girls classifies their cases as non-family abduction, so maybe someone who all three or one of the girls was familiar with, but not family. Police officials have said that the girls left the mall with an individual that they trusted and were harmed afterwards. In terms of Deborah, there's questions over her and Tommy working together, but I failed to see any motive they might have had. In 2000, Deborah gave a statement to the local newspaper saying that she had nothing to do with the disappearance, and in response, she was asked by Rusty and family of Julie and Lisa to cooperate with the Fort Worth Police and the FBI, as well as take a polygraph test. I don't know if she did any of that or not. Deborah, Rusty and Rachel's mother Fran has never entertained the idea that Deborah could be involved in disappearance and it seems that both Fran and Deborah theorise that the girls were taken into what they call white slavery. They believe that the girls were abducted by somebody from another country and were sold into the world of human trafficking. It's not out of the realms of possibility for sure, but this suggests something much deeper than just a nefarious person who potentially ran into the girls in the mall and took their chance. I doubt this would have been a family friend. I certainly don't think personally that this was a pre-planned abduction, or at least not pre-planned to the moment. The trip to the mall that day with the girls seemed to be very spontaneous. Julie wasn't supposed to come, both Terry and Deborah and Tommy were invited to join. There were too many variables. But without a body or solid proof, there's no way of knowing for sure. Many people do think Rachel was alive until much later, but I don't really know how that fits into the theories. Maybe they really did just run away, but why not take the car? Why allow Julie to come with them? Why write the letter if they never intended to return? I personally just don't think runaway fits here at all. There has been small movement in the case in the last few years, but nothing major. There's a lake seven miles from the mall called Benbrook Lake, and after much fundraising, Rusty eventually raised enough money to search the lake, convinced that they might find something to do with the girl's disappearance. He said he was drawn to the lake after learning about someone whose car went missing around the time the girls disappeared, and knew that if a person wanted to dispose of a car, the most logical place in the area to do it would have been Benbrook Lake. And they did indeed find three cars, 40 foot deep, at the bottom of the lake. In 2018, they were able to bring up two of these, but after examination by five local scientists, it was found that neither had anything to do with the girls. They were unable to raise the third car because of flooding at the time, so Rusty actually went as far as to get a certification to dive and invented a system to raise vehicles out of the water in order to examine that one as well. In late 2019, they went back to raise it on a boat named after his sister, and Rusty dove down with the team, but they found they were unable to bring the car up because the condition of it was just too dangerous, it was rusting and falling apart. Fort Worth police are not involved in the search of Benbrook Lake, and they have said that there is no link between the lake and this case, as well as saying that pulling up the cars is dangerous. But Rusty has said that he will continue searching for his sister until there's either not a breath left in his body, or he finds out what happened but he says he thinks they'll find out what happened first. He's also said that his mother is still alive, or at least she was as of 2018, aged 82, and he doesn't want his mum to die not knowing what happened to her daughter. Both Renee and Julie's mums sadly both died with no answers. Someone who works at the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office has said, the reason I help Rusty and take his calls is because he is driving this case. If Rusty wasn't doing this, nothing would be happening. Investigators have said that they're utilising DNA testing in their investigation, but most of it does seem to be falling on the family. 
They continue to search through brush and creek beds and country roads for any clue, but the honest truth is there just isn't much movement here. These girls disappeared from a mall two days before Christmas. It would have been rammed with people. Sure, that means that maybe you wouldn't remember individual people or faces, but that's more eyes who could have seen what happened, more potential witnesses. Again, this solidifies for me that this had to have been someone known to the girls, because how brazen do you have to be to try and kidnap three girls, two in their late teens, from a busy shopping mall in broad daylight two days before Christmas? They must have walked out happily with somebody. This story needs to be shared, it needs to be spoken about to keep it alive. There is always a chance for answers, there's always someone who knows something subconsciously or not that could hold the key to unlocking this whole case. It's just about reaching that person. As always, if you live in the Fort Worth area, please share this story, talk about it, and I'll leave relevant contact details for the authorities in the description box just in case. Renee Wilson would now be 61 years old, Rachel Trelisa would be 64, and Julianne Mosley would be 56. And age progressed photos of each have been released by the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children. If you recognise any of these faces, again, please don't hesitate to contact the authorities, or there's the missing Fort Worth Trio Facebook page that you can join. Again, I'll leave it linked down below. Thank you so much for watching. I think this is going to be my last video before the new year. So happy new year and I'll see you in 2022. Bye guys.